if we do that sales and marketing promotion, but then we distribute poor quality product out to consumers, that's going to come back and hurt the manufacturer very significantly, very, very quickly. If we send out product that is not safe for consumption, that's going to really hurt the manufacturing brand. Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now, here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at digital transformation consulting firm Elevate IQ. When we think of growth, we often don't consider quality as a cornerstone for enabling it, especially in the SMB space. Perceived quality of your products can lead to poor customer experience, disengaged consumers, and financial implications. All of these factors will have an impact on P&L and slow your growth down. Quality control is of paramount importance for growth for brands seeking the path of D2C. In today's episode, we have our guest Jason Chester from Infinity QS who shares his thoughts on how evolving consumer trends are forcing manufacturers to rethink their approach to managing manufacturing processes and how by optimizing your operations across the three fundamentals of cost, value, and risk will ensure long-term growth, competitiveness, and ultimately profitability. For new manufacturing business and SMBs with ambitious growth plans, rethinking your approach will enable you to leverage the substantial growth opportunities that exist in today's global consumer society and the frictionless global market. Jason Chester has over 25 years of experience working directly within the enterprise IT industry. After starting his career as a software engineer, he moved into the IT analyst world where his work focused on how information technology capabilities can deliver sustainable and transformative business value to end user organizations. He now leads global channel partner operations for Infinity QS, a world leader in manufacturing quality intelligence and statistical process control solutions. With that, let's get to the conversation. Hey, Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sam. Jason, before we start, as you know, the topic we are going to be discussing today is going to be quality initiative. In the quality community, my understanding is that a lot of people know you. They know about your company as well. What about the other folks and my audience that do not know anything about your company or your background? Would you like to give us a brief about what you guys do, who you help? Yeah, certainly. So Infinity QS, so we've been around now for approaching 30 years. We have extensive experience of providing quality intelligence and manufacturing intelligence solutions into manufacturing that are based on statistical process control. We help clients, large and small, from multinational manufacturing organizations right down to you know small single plant manufacturing uh, operations, where we utilize fairly advanced um, data collection analytics, intelligence, and statistical process control solutions to help them optimize their manufacturing or their production processes. Uh, so a lot of, lot of years of experience uh, in, the, uh, in the field. 30 years is a very long time, Jason. It is. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, so I think I uh, caught a couple of things, and pardon me here because I don't really have as much familiarity in the, in the quality space. And... Um, Think of me as your manufacturer, and I'm actually trying to understand how I can utilize quality processes for my business. So I caught some of the terms as per your conversation, such as quality intelligence, manufacturing intelligence. They sound fancy, but tell me a little bit more about how they can help me. 
Okay, excellent. Yeah, so let's let's just take a, a look at you know typical manufacturing organisation and the markets that they serve, whether they're B two B manufacturers or B two C consumer manufacturers, etc. You know there are a lot of changes happening in the uh, in the markets that they serve. We've got advances in global logistics that are lowering competitive barriers to entry for manufacturers. It's kind of creating this global single market we have now online e-commerce and price comparison sites and distribution channels online which are really creating much much frictionless uh, markets that those manufacturers serve and also the in the the supply side as well you know we have a lot of you know online supply chain hubs and and, and e-commerce platforms and, and that sort of thing you know, we have the whole kind of online social media. You know, we have this consumer base that is now able to influence one another very effectively where they can rate and review. They can share good and bad stories. They can name and shame brand. You know, even the consumers themselves are, are shifting. They're becoming what I call more promiscuous. They're becoming less loyal to brands and where other factors take more of a priority. They're becoming more thrifty. They can be more cost sensitive, uh, etc. You know, they're more con conscious consumers they're they're very very uh, cognizant towards you know recycling and upcycling etc and they're very ethical now they they shun corporations that have a disregard for for waste and corporate responsibility and environmental responsibility and they have a voice to be able to share those things across the consumer space you know almost instantly to very large numbers etc so that is what i kind of collectively called the liberal, liberalization of markets. And, and that's a very significant change for manufacturers. But equally, there are opportunities as well. New markets are emerging on the back of that, new opportunities, you know, opportunities for new products and new innovations, etc. You know, we've got new easy access to emerging economies and emerging markets. We've got a growth in population. And, and generally, you know, the economic Global economic and wealth growth, be it, you know, some would argue not equitably, is, is increasing significantly. And we are genuinely in this kind of era of, of mass consumption. So that's really creating a very challenging environment for manufacturers and an environment where there's a lot of opportunity for growth for manufacturers, whether they be small startup manufacturers or established manufacturers looking to expand into new markets and, and grow, etc. So what's really critical for a manufacturer to be able to address those challenges, and, and this is where I focus on three really important dimensions, and they are cost, value, and risk. So cost is obviously really keeping costs as low as possible, reducing waste, reducing resource usage, being more efficient, being more productive. And that obviously doesn't just impact on the profitability of the manufacturing organization, but allows them to be more competitive in the markets from a price perspective, etc. The dimension of value would be about quality. One thing that co those consumers do demand is better, faster, cheaper. So quality is absolutely paramount. You know, even if we very cost competitive in particular markets, we can't give way to quality. You know, quality has got to be the number one priority. But value also applies to things like the, the ability for a manufacturer to be able to adapt to changes in the market to be more flexible, to be more agile, to provide more capability to get innovative products out to market quickly, etc. And then the risk element falls into two categories. There's the operational risk that a manufacturer might have, such as, you know, operational risks, machine downtimes, quality issues, workforce issues, etc., right through to strategic risks where potentially, you know, a food safety issue in, a, in the case of a food beverage manufacturer, for instance, could really damage brand reputation or even the cost of quality or safety recalls, product recalls, etc. can be devastating on a business. So yeah, so, so really what we do is really help manufacturers to optimize across those three dimensions of cost, value and risk. Amazing. So there are a couple of things that jumped out to me based on your conversation, especially the liberalization of market. That's very new for me. I, I did not know that term existed for this one. So maybe we need to have another show for that. <laughs> I'd be and welcome the, to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> and the other three dimensions that you mentioned, the cost, value, and risk, I think we need to talk a lot more about that. But before that, what I really wanted to discuss is the quality being number one priority. 
So as a business owner, my priority is always to get money in my bank account. And the focus of this podcast is really growth for these smaller to medium-sized businesses. So why is quality the number one priority for me? Well, I think if you look at traditional um, or even current manufacturing environments, there's a heavy emphasis towards manufacturing automation. So in, in, in recent years, you know, we've invested heavily in, in automating the production process itself. You know, it's very rare now, unless it's a, an artisan kind of product producer or whatever, that all of those manufacturing processes manual, you know, even right back decades ago to the, the introduction of the, the, the automated production line, etc. It, it's become commonplace. But a, an automated production environment isn't an optimized production environment. We can still get a lot of waste in automation. We can still get poor quality products in automation. An automated production process does what it's pre-programmed to do, whether it's filling bottles of of sauce or cans or making packaging or making components for for uh, automotive uh, industry clients, etc. We have this automated production environment, and we've gained a lot of benefit over the years from that. We've displaced a lot of labour. We've dramatically increased efficiency. We've dramatically increased productivity. But when you look at quality alongside of that, the quality process is really unchanged as it was perhaps 10, 20, 30 years ago. We have this production process going. We have an inspection station at predetermined intervals. We take a certain number of pieces of products off the production line. We inspect them through various different characteristics and features, and we write down the results on a, on a sheet or we input them into an Excel spreadsheet, and then we let the line run, and then we'll test again further down the line. And then at the end of the line, when we're about to package the, the product up or, or distribute it to the customer, we may do a, a final uh, inspection of one in a thousand pieces or, you know, one in a, you know, every hour or something like that to check that the quality of those products are within specification. But let me give you an example. The products may be in specification, but that doesn't mean to say that we're, we're optimizing that production line. So I once worked fairly recently with a alcoholic beverage uh, supplier that filled you know many many bottles in a high speed bottling line and there are rules and regulations about the uh, fill volumes of content like that where you know if you bought a bottle of bourbon for instance and it was below the label stated content of 750 milliliters then you wouldn't be happy of, with that as a consumer and neither would the regulators so they allow you a certain amount of of underfill tolerance but it's fairly narrow so the general trend in the industry is to overfill those bottles so that then when they get variability in the bottle filling process, they're not at risk of going below that label stated content allowance. But imagine that, you know, we're filling bottles with a lot more product than we actually need to. But technically, the product is within specification. And so this particular company, they would they would monitor that by knowing in, in a given lot like 8000 bottles how much volume of liquid has passed through the filler heads and divide that by the number of bottles and the volume of each of those bottles and is the average on track for would be within specification and if it is that batch would be uh, would, would be released if it wasn't that whole batch would be scrapped so that's 8000 bottles of of alcoholic beverage which is which is expensive to produce and and potentially you know lucrative to sell was literally scrapped because that um, that label stated con content couldn't be verified. So imagine that differently. You know, we only know that that process has got inherent variability as we're checking it. So if we check one every 500 bottles, we only know that that one bottle in 500 is within specification. And then if there is a problem, thousands of bottles have been produced by the time we get to be able to take remedial action to fix the problem that's clearly not good. So, you know, with, with, a, with a solution like Infinity QS, where we can monitor data in, in real time and monitor the variability of those filling processes in real time, not only we can we predict when an out-of-specification event might occur to enable them to make corrective action prior to that specification event becoming an issue, but also trying to make the gap narrower between the overfill and the underfill. So they're not giving product away unnecessarily 
and they're not at risk of you know um, uh, annoying the consumers that buy an underfilled bottle or causing a problem with the regulators for shipping products with not enough uh, content in it, etc. So that's just an example of where moving away from traditional quality management processes and through to quality optimization or manufacturing optimization can really make a fundamental difference to the bottle to the bottom line uh, and that's you know just an example of what we see in the industry by taking quality and bringing that into the 21st century where at the moment in a lot of scenarios it's almost been separate to that investment that we've been made been making in automation amazing when i look at what you just mentioned the way i'm interpreting this is based on what i have personally seen with the manufacturers typically when they they measure their quality the process my understanding is called sampling so where they what they are going to do is they are going to take a couple of sample products to be able to test and those are the only ones that are being tested and rest are going to be assumed to be tested and based on that i think there is going to be a real problem of the overfilling and underfilling and that's the point that you just mentioned so in case of alcoholic beverage i can see the problem but do you see this problem happening with the other industries as well where we don't have the problem of overfill versus underfill yes absolutely i mean you can see that across all industries and uh, another example is and it just take a step back in that you know typically when a when a quality issue occurs it's occurred for a reason there is it's either a machine problem or a problem in the process or a, a worker that's made an error on a machine setting there is some causal factor in that quality event more often than not and again you know you talk about sampling and you're absolutely right product is withdrawn off the line and tested but how do we correlate that in real time to the environment that's producing that product so take um, a manufacturer of cookies for instance you know we we take all of these raw materials we mix them together in a certain way to, according to a certain recipe then we go through certain processes like forming them into a cookie shape letting them rest we then put them through an oven you know we then you know maybe glaze them or dust them with icing sugar or whatever it is when you get bad product off the line it's invariably because you know something within that process as you know variability has happened or or a problem has happened which has led to that quality event but in but when we just talk about sampling in isolation we take a product off the line and we determine that it's not within within uh, reasonable limits or within specification limits etc but actually if we monitor the production line at the same time as the, you know the characteristics of the product then we're in a much better position to make correlations between right okay we're getting these overcooked cookies because the oven temperature is slightly too high or the belt speed is slightly too low so if we can optimize those manufacturing environment variables then we're not going to get product that's out of spec in the first place so that significantly reduces waste and i know that that's another food example but another example might be in in packaging manufacturers you know where ingredients into making pt bottles for instance you know have to have a certain ingredients added like a uv ultraviolet protection additive put in that's a very expensive raw material so they try and limit the amount of uv additive that goes into those products to try and limit obviously waste of a of a high value ingredient but if you have too little you know uv protection ingredient in the uh, in the pet bottles then inevitably what's in those pet bottles can can spoil either in the distribution chain or on the supply chain or on the in the consumer's hands for instance or you put too much in and then you've got unnecessary cost in the in the manufacturing process so it it's prevalent all around us you know we can we can see it in automotive you know in automotive components that there are very you know strict automotive standards in the uh, in the tier 1 automotive OEMs at the supplies that they get so unless the product absolutely meets a stringent requirement the automotive OEM isn't really that bothered if if the 100 products that they've ordered has it taken the manufacturer a thousand previous products to get the 100 good ones or 110 previous ones to get the 100 good products so it, it's all about performance and productivity and you see it prevalently across all sectors 
Okay, I think you touched on several different industries there. Just to recap, you talked about food and beverage, then you talked about the automotive industry and the packaging as well. All of the industries could could benefit from the real-time quality monitoring that may not be part of their current system that they might be using, especially ERP. And my understanding of the manufacturing floor, there are two cases that we see typically with manufacturers Number one is going to be if they are running the production floor manually. The second is going to be either the combination of ERP or MES. Yes. Uh, is that in common in your experience as well, Jason? Can you talk a little bit about how your platform would talk to ERP? So let's say if I am a manufacturer and I use ERP for my quality processes because I need to gather data related to quality in my ERP. So how would these two systems work together on the production floor? So they are absolutely complementary. And I think that's where there is often a lot of confusion or potentially even misconceptions about where manufacturing intelligence fits with ERP and MES. But typically, MES and ERP systems manage the environment up until a product goes into a physical production. So a lot might be released into production and scheduled into production on a on a specific line and there might be you know 8,000 units of a particular product being made and then the final quality inspection characteristics of that lot and potentially even some sampling characteristics might then get fed back to the ERP or MES system so that in the future you can look up that particular lot number and see what the final quality inspection characteristics were for it you know if there was a custom complaint or a, or any other event that needed investigation etc. But really, that's where MES and ERP kind of stop and really where solutions like Infinity QS begins, because what we focus on is from when that product goes into production is really monitoring all of the process environment and the quality characteristics of that product whilst it is in production and be able to use in statistical process control, being able to alert to abnormal trends or abnormal variability to be able to predict when you know machine settings need to change or when the production environment needs to change to ensure that we're keeping that product as close to uh, specification as possible uh, or within the center of specification as, as possible. And then at the end of that, all of that statistical summary can also then be integrated back into the MES and, and ERP solution. So it's really that when the product is in production where solutions like quality intelligence really come into their own. And obviously, if you scale that up across a, a, a manufacturer with multiple lines or multiple facilities or even multiple you know, regions, then that all of that information can be aggregated up so they can compare performance across processes, across products, et cetera, to see where you know, the opportunities for improvement. And, and typically, that is not what MES and ERP solutions are designed to do. Okay, so I think I'm convinced on the value of real-time quality monitoring. There's definitely a value, but I want to shift the gear a bit. And uh, I would like to touch in terms of real hard dollars, because we are talking about the growth podcast here, right? Um, So obviously, uh, we can do as much processes as we want. We can implement as much quality as we want. Uh, But when is going to be the right time to implement quality for a manufacturer when I have to compete with my other priorities such as sales and marketing or R&D? So what would be your recommendation to implement these quality processes and which industry? What is the right time to implement the quality initiatives? So I I, I think that um, the right time to internet uh, implement quality initiatives is absolutely right now. I mean, you know, for a manufacturing organization, what those organizations do is manufacture products. The sales and the marketing and promotional aspects are route to get those products out to market. But go back to what we talked about earlier in the uh, in the session, Sam, if we do that sales and marketing promotion, but then we distribute poor quality product out to consumers that's going to come back and hurt the manufacturer very significantly, very, very quickly. If we send out product that is not safe for consumption, that's going to really hurt the manufacturing brand, uh, et cetera. Or even if, we don't, you know, if we've got high volumes of waste and we struggle with efficiency and we struggle with you know, output and productivity, then if we get a sudden increase in demand because of a successful sales promotion, then we leave consumers wanting because they can't get that product quickly because we've got backlogs, we've got issues in the manufacturing process, etc. 
quality has got to be the underpinning of all of that. And it, it is certainly with you know modern cloud-based implementations of quality intelligence, those things can be achieved very quickly. They can be achieved very cost-effectively. The whole notion of digital transformation being a, a very long-term, high-cost, high-risk strategy for organizations, it's just simply not true anymore. You know, we can deploy quality intelligence very tactically you know and cloud-based solutions that don't require you know any any kind of specific infrastructure or investment up front means that you know we can we can get in you know solving very specific problems in very specific areas and then potentially expand out those capabilities as the manufacturer needs to or as the manufacturer grows etc and that's the the beauty of the scalability around cloud Yeah, I think you bring a very good point there with respect to sales and marketing. As business owners, we have a tendency to push a lot for sales and marketing. But I think what matters end of the day is going to be the customer experience. So even if you have your fancy sales and marketing, but let's say if the customers are receiving the the poor quality product, they are not going to come back. In fact, they might not be able to refer you to the other customers because of that experience, uh, or they might be talking online. I think you brought one element about social media as well, that nowadays customer voice is going to be really important too. So let's say if they have had bad experience with your product, they are going to be talking on social media channels. And the word of mouth is not going to be good, which is one of the pillars of the the influential marketing. So I definitely, definitely agree with your point there with respect to thinking of quality as one of the pillars as part of your overall strategy. Do you agree with me? I, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. And, and you know, just, just reiterate that, that point around cost, value and risk is that, you know, we often think in terms of just reducing cost and just maximizing value and eliminating risk. And actually, that's quite a misnomer as well. It's much more complicated than that. And this is where it does get you know, quite tricky for manufacturers because, you know, yes, we can reduce the risk of a poor quality product down to almost zero by testing every single product that comes off the line. But that's uneconomical. <laughs> you know, we can, we can reduce cost further and further and further down, but in, we'll get to a point where we start to impact on agility and flexibility or will start to impact on product quality, um, etc. So it's about achieving that optimal balance between those three dimensions of cost, value and risk. And only when a, a manufacturer have got that optimal kind of state do they know that they're absolutely they've got the the manufacturing capabilities behind their organization to be able to support those sales and marketing initiatives cost effectively and, and, and you know and effectively to be able to support whatever it is the business wants to do. If you've got a, a business where they've, you know, they've, they're pushing very well on the sales and marketing initiatives and you know, export initiatives and channels to market and that sort of thing, but they don't have that top-notch manufacturing capability, then it will rapidly unravel. And that's our, ex- our experience, certainly, with a lot of manufacturers. Quality has got to be at the top there uh, as a strategy. Okay, so I really like those three terms, uh, cost, value, and uh, risk, and I'm probably going to take this to the next level, and I'm going to create an acronym there for that, and I'm going to call it CVR. I really like that because uh, that is similar to project management. I think they talk about the triangle where they have similar pillars, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, the, uh, yes, and and you know the the approach is obviously very common. We're in an industry that doesn't shy away from three letter acronyms, but yeah, I mean it is a very effective way <laughs> just dis- to distill a lot what we talk about down into those three dimensions because I do think it all does boil down to to that, and that can be complex, and when you don't have the tools in place to be able to deal with that complexity inevitably then it gets overlooked and it doesn't done, get done because it's seen as a you know as a thing that's too hard to do and and that just isn't the case with today's technologies and today's tools okay amazing so i think i'm sold on the value of the manufacturing automation real time quality monitoring i think there's definitely value with this but as a business owner i need to prioritize right obviously i have got so many different initiatives So I'm actually looking for some sort of actionable advice and let's say 30, 60, 90 day plan. If I want to implement the quality initiatives in my organization, how would you recommend the 30, 60, 90 approach for me? 
So we we have a very defined um, uh, methodology internally within Infinity QS, and and this is very much around what we call a proof of concept. And we actually have a thirty day um, you know time frame on our proof of concept. So we aim to work with manufacturers to get them up and running with a proof of concept, and and that's a very very focused in scope so it might be a particular production line a particular product or a particular process where we implement a quality intelligence proof of concept project to address that immediate challenge so they might choose which which process or which product do they have the most problem with what do they have the most waste with what do they have the most variability or unpredictability with etc and really focus on a proof of concept trial because there is no better way to prove the value to a manufacturing client than for them to see the value of a solution in their own environment with their own processes. You know, we can provide endless case studies and and success stories from other sectors and from other industries, but every manufacturer is different. Every manufacturing environment is different. So 30 days, you can do a focus proof of concept to create that business value proof point internally within your manufacturing organization. Then once you've done that, that gives you the confidence then that you can scale up, um, you know, very effectively to other areas. And this is the beauty of, of, as I mentioned before, about, you know, cloud-based products now. You know, you don't need to install, you know, servers and database servers and have a data center provisioned or, you know, new networks put in place. I mean, you know, just a device with an internet browser and you're good to go. They're, they're scalable, they're elastic. If you, you know, certainly with like Infinity QS, there are no long-term commitments or contracts. You're not signing up to an annual agreement. It's a, it's a subscription-based product. So, you know, it's, it's an operational expense rather than the capital expenditure. You can scale as you scale within the business. So you can put a plan in place for focus proof of concept within 30 days, an expanded proof of concept within 60 days, even a, a full line or a full plant pilot within 90 days, and then potentially an enterprise-wide rollout within within six to 12 months. So very, very, fa- very fast time to value, very scalable and, and very cost effective. You know, and, and the, again, the final point on that is that demand obviously changes, you know, as we've seen this year with the pandemic, demand can be up and down. And so can usage of cloud-based solutions like quality intelligence. You can acquire and uh, more licenses when they're required and reduce that license count when they're not required. And, and that works well as well for seasonal manufacturers uh, as well. Okay, amazing. So one thing that uh, jumped out to me uh, overall from the show is uh, each manufacturing environment is, is different. And I couldn't agree more with that. So with that, Jason, I think, you know, we are done with the show. Do you have any last minute thoughts that you would like to share with the audience? No, I think that's been a great conversation. There are a lot of opportunities. I guess the only the only point I would would share is that you know whilst every manufacturer is different, manufacturers can also learn from other companies even in different sectors. We talked earlier about the difference between food and beverage or automotive components or or packaging manufacturers, etc. Whilst there are a lot of differences there are also a lot of similarities and and you might learn techniques around quality um, in one industry that can be applied with great effect to another industry so that kind of cross-pollination of of techniques and ideas from different industries can be can be really important as well yeah i couldn't agree more with the cross-pollination aspect of learning i think that's the foundation of learning in my mind Um, so again uh, thank you so much jason for your time really appreciate it and uh, you have a wonderful day you too it's been uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, enjoyable having this conversation with you thanks sam i cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show and sharing their knowledge and journey i always pick up stuff from our guests and hopefully you learned something new today if you want to know further about Jason or Infinity QS, please visit infinityqs.com. They are currently offering three months free trial of their real-time quality intelligence and statistical process control software called Inact. If you are interested in trying for your quality operations, links and more information will also be available in the show notes. If anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business, you might want to check other related episodes, including the interview with Michael Bagg from AMZ Advisors, who brings a unique perspective on D2C from Amazon as a marketing channel. 
also the interview with Chase Climber from Electric Eye who touches on D2C from the e-commerce toolset and architecture standpoint. Also, don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you and I hope to catch you on the next episode of the WBS Podcast. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.